have always given bread for the coming day. And though I am poor today, I believe. Hello, I'm glad you're here. I'm Mark Dodson, one of the priests in the Abidor Deanery team. Welcome to this worship for Sunday the 21st of June. I'm going to hear from Julie Lunn about welcome. Maggie Tate and Diane Bates are going to lead us in our prayers. Maggie is a student on placement with us from Trinity College Bristol. Diane is a reader, a licensed lay minister in the US Herald Group. You can follow the service as it goes through. Along the bottom of the screen, there will be the titles for gathering, dwelling, blessing, and so on. Perhaps you've got a piece of bread ready and a candle ready to light. If not, you might like to pause the video and go and find some. If you have some bread, maybe you followed our recipe. We sent out a Franciscan version. I think it was designed to make some fairly flat uh, and crispy wafers. I had a bit of a Blue Peter moment with mine, as you can see. It may be that you got the recipe from our deanery email or from the Facebook page. If you've no idea what I'm talking about, email Anne Lloyd. Her address is going across the bottom of the screen now. Anne is our mission coordinator and she'll tell you everything you need to know about receiving the email, which comes out occasionally, and about the Facebook page through which we exchange all kinds of ideas and thoughts and offer suggestions and reflections. In a moment we're going to join together with the Royal Garrison Church in Aldershot as they lead our singing through the marvels of Tinterweb of course. The theme today is refuge and shelter. We're going to be thinking about the fact that it's been International Refugee Week and the bread and the candle will play a part in that. I am glad you're here. If you can, stand and we'll sing together. Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided.
Hello, I'm Julie. In 2016, um, my home was gradually emptying. It had been a very full house and it became clear to me and to Colin, my husband, that we were going to have a lot of space here. At the same time, we were seeing on the news, lots and lots about people who were trying to get to the UK and sometimes managing it in really difficult circumstances, asylum seekers. We decided after some conversation that we should do what we could. And what we thought we could do was to offer a welcome to somebody. So after quite a lot of um, talking to social workers and so on, we were accepted to give supported accommodation to a young person who was seeking asylum in the UK. And the young person who arrived in April 2016 was a 16 year old from Sudan. He'd had a very different life to the one we had and um, there were many, many things I think that we didn't understand when he arrived and which he didn't understand about us or about this place. His experience had been one which I can only describe as desperate. His mum had decided to send her 15 year old away from home to sell her home in order to pay for him to do that because she was so worried about him. So worried that he was being targeted by the authorities. So he'd set out on a journey um, all alone, left behind his home, his family, his all his friends, everything that was familiar. And he'd come all the way to the UK. That meant traveling to Libya and coming across the Mediterranean and traveling up to Calais where he'd been for some time and, and then finally coming across the channel and presenting himself in London in the end to the police and saying he was seeking asylum. I don't know, I, I can't imagine what that must have been like at such a young age. He'd already lived through war, seen people killed, um, and this, all these things gradually came out in the course of conversation with him. But to a large extent, through the eight months he was with us, he, I think, protected us from a lot of what he'd seen um, in his life. I'm really glad he came to us. And for me, he's a part of our family now, like one of my children. I, I decided right from the start that what I wanted to do was to treat him as I would hope one of my own children would be treated in the same circumstances. And very quickly we grew to love him. And that's not to say that it was easy. It wasn't because he, um, he was... He missed home, he missed everything. He, he, he'd been through a lot of difficult, traumatic things. People don't do this journey 
for no reason. And sometimes it was hard work. He was a 16 year old boy. <laughs> sometimes he was older than his age. Sometimes he, he was like a tiny child. And we never quite knew what each day would bring. He's now gone to live in Liverpool and, and um, he's going to college and his English is very good. He, he picked up the language very quickly, but he found it hard to live in a place like Hereford. He found it hard because he was so different. He was a black African and he felt out of place. So now he's at college, he's also got a part-time job and he's managing lockdown all on his own. I think for us, he, he will always be a member of our family now and we love him dearly. The picture I painted is one that I painted after he'd gone and I didn't really set out to paint a picture of a boat coming across the Mediterranean, but sometimes we, we start painting and, and there it is. I've kept it because it reminds me to pray for him and it reminds me to pray for every one of those people who are coming in desperation because we need to remember that every one of them has their own story. Every one of them is a child of God like us. Hi, I'm Maggie. Um, and it was great to hear from Julie there, wasn't it? I really enjoyed that, thanks. Um, we are going to respond together now um, uh, reflecting on some of the things that Julie has shared. I'm going to lead a sentence and then please join in with the response. So we'll take a moment to pause before we pray together. With the people in Uganda we say A refugee from South Sudan is my brother. With the people of Bangladesh, we say. A refugee from Myanmar is my sister. With the people of Lebanon, we say. A refugee from Syria is my cousin. With the people of Ecuador, we say. A refugee from Colombia is my mother. With the people of South Africa, we say. A refugee from Congo is my father. With the people of Kenya, we say. A refugee from Somalia is my niece. With the people of Germany, we say. A refugee from Eritrea is my grandmother. With the people of our communities, we say. Refugees from around the world are my kin. Like God's people of old, in thanksgiving, we remember and say. Remember, O oh God, how others welcomed us and our kin as family, and we desire to respond in the same way. Help us to be family to those who have lost their homes and their communities. Amen. Brother, sister, let me serve you.
about 15 years ago, I trained as a spiritual director, someone who accompanies others on their pilgrimage, their journey of faith as it unfolds day by day. Part of that learning was to discover much of the wisdom of the Christian tradition and some ancient practices that have held people in God's hand over the centuries. One of those is called the examine. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But the practice is about sitting at the end of each day and reflecting on two questions. What am I most grateful for and what am I least grateful for? Tricky. When I learned the practice, I was introduced to it through a story called Sleeping with Bread, holding what is important to us, holding what gives us life. What gives us life? That's a good question to live with. I'm going to read the story now. During the bombing raids of World War II, thousands of children were left orphaned and to starve. The fortunate ones were rescued and placed in refugee camps where they received good food and good care. But many of these children had lost so much that they could not sleep at night. They feared waking up to find themselves once again homeless and without food. Nothing seemed to reassure them. Finally, someone hit upon the idea of giving each child a piece of bread to hold at night. Holding their bread at bedtime, these children could finally sleep in peace. All through the night, the bread was there to remind them, today I ate and I will eat again tomorrow.
refugees, we're going to pray together for refugees now. If you have a candle handy, um, now is the time to get it. Um, I've got mine here and I'm going to light it and then I will lead us in some prayers and the responses will appear on the screen. Um, so this is one to keep your eyes open for and join in if you would like to. Our loving and compassionate God, we know you grieve where there is violence, where there is oppression, where there is hatred in the world. We know you stand with the refugees in our world today, just as you stood with our ancestors in the faith who were compelled to flee their homes, like Moses, like Ruth, like Jeremiah, like Paul, and even like Jesus and his parents. We pray for comfort for those who mourn. We hold before you those who have lost their homes, those who have lost their communities, those who have lost their families. We grieve with them and long to reach out to them to bring your healing comfort. We pray for peace, that those who bring war will change their ways and beat their swords into plowshares. We pray for reconciliation in broken communities where hate is sown in the soil of prejudice and watered by our indifference. We pray for courage and wisdom as we look for ways to be your agents of comfort and peace in a world that needs your holy and healing touch. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's have a look again at those two questions. For what am I most grateful and for what am I most? <clears throat> Let's have a look again at those two questions. For what am I most grateful? For what am I least grateful? Of course, there are probably 101 other ways of asking the same questions for you might like to ask uh, when did I give and receive the most love today when did I give or receive the least love when did I feel the most connected with God the universe and everything when did I feel the least connected or the most disconnected from God and everyone so Ignatius in his writings talks about desolation and consolation. Consolations are those times when we feel the most connected to God. Desolation when we feel the most disconnected. And that examine practice is about teasing out 
those discoveries in the everyday. God is present with us in the everyday things of life, in every moment of every day, as it comes and goes. Of course, we're often busy somewhere else, and we miss God in those moments. But at the end of the day, perhaps lighting a candle again, and sitting with those questions, we can connect ourselves with the things that have brought that sense of connection with God, with other people, with everything that it, there is, or those sense of disconnection. And those times are important. Today, I am most grateful for family who are kind to me and listen to me with honesty. And today, I am least grateful for the fact that I can't see people in person at the moment. Today, I am most grateful for faith and Christian hope, which is the foundation of everything else in life. Today, I'm least grateful for things which divide and diminish us.
those times are important because God is constantly being revealed through those moments of everyday life, those moments of connection and disconnection. I'm going to talk us through a simple way of that. Those moments are important because it's just in those moments that God reveals himself. Those moments are important because those are the moments in which God is revealed in the everyday things of life. Experience is perhaps the best teacher. I'm going to talk through now a way of practising the examine. I'm going to encourage you to do it with me now, perhaps as a preparation for another time, an evening, a night time, when you can find a little space a little quiet and practice it for yourself. It's best if you can be seated on a chair or a stool that supports you comfortably uh, with your back against the rest if there is one, your feet firmly on the floor, that's both of them, no legs crossed. Uh, we don't want your blood supply being interrupted. You might like to place your hands uh, on one on each thigh or perhaps cradle them in, in your lap. I'm only asking you to do that so that they can be at rest and at ease too. You might like to gently close your eyes or focus on something in the mid distance so you're alert and aware but not being distracted. It's often good to place a hand on your heart to reconnect with that centre of your being. And as you feel your chest rise and expand and fall as the breath enters and leaves your body, connect yourself with that source of inspiration that creates you in every moment. Some people find it helpful to create for themselves at home a space where they can connect with God regularly. That might be a good thing to do at this time. Many of us are feeling completely disconnected with loved ones, with colleagues, disconnected with all that's familiar, the rhythms and routines, the places that shape our lives and give us sense. Perhaps gather a book or two, a Bible you were given, an image, perhaps something you've drawn yourself, a place to sit and be. Feeling again your breath enter, your chest rise and expand, that connection with your heart centre. That sense of God's presence with you in the stillness and wonder. For what am I most grateful today? For what am I least grateful? How have I given and received love? How have I not? What has connected me with the centre of the universe with God? The centre of creation? With God's revelation in the Bible? With the everyday experiences of life? And when have I been disconnected and caught up in thoughts of anxiety and sadness? When has my mind run away with me and brought misery? When have I been connected through words on the radio or images on the television, through a phone call from a loved one or a colleague, through Zoom perhaps or FaceTime, WhatsApp? When have I felt disconnected alone and apart. When we call those things to mind, it's not to welcome one and reject the other, to welcome only what we might call good and reject what we find unsatisfactory. It's to know God through each of those. For in those times of desolation, we can discover God's presence. In those times of consolation, we can be rather too full of ourselves. 
So this practice is a grounding one. For what am I most grateful? For what am I least grateful? I welcome them both. I welcome them as teachers. I welcome them though they may sweep my house clean and rattle around in my body and my brain. How do I sense and feel that for which I'm most grateful and least grateful in my body? It's occasionally said that our bodies don't lie. Our brains are somewhat trickier. What has my body taught me today about the things through which I've been connected with God and disconnected? What is my body teaching me about sadness, about anxiety? What news, welcome or unwelcome, is my body bringing each day that my brain overrides? For what am I most grateful? For what am I least grateful today? And once those things have emerged, hold them before God. You might imagine them open in the palms of your hand. You might imagine as you breathe God in, that you breathe your worries and concerns out. That as you breathe in love, you breathe out fear. Talk with God about what you're discovering. Listen. it's a practice of gratitude so be thankful thank God thank God for those things for which you are most grateful thank God too for those least grateful things consolation desolation connectedness disconnection all can speak of God's love 